So with this, I would like to start uh, the first presentation. Um, since I'm the uh, chair of this troll, I should, I should introduce myself briefly. I will introduce my colleagues, of course. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I am Ali Sheikh Al-Islami, and I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. I have been at that university for about 20 years, and I've been working a lot in the past 15 years on jitter and phase noise, in particular in applications such as wireline. So that's essentially my background. Um, with that, let us start. So, as I said, the title of this presentation is Fundamental Concepts in Jitter and Phase Noise. So, I start with a, a motivation of why we're spending time on jitter and phase noise, and then I uh, start defining, because this is going to be fundamental, I'm going to define uh, what is jitter, and then how do we characterize and classify jitter. Um, I will provide you a very simple example of um, jitter in ring oscillator just to warm you up for the rest of the trial that um, my colleague is going to do. And then I will go and talk about phase noise. So jitter is just an, our entry point, but then we're going to continue with the um, phase noise and excess phase and the concepts and the relationship really between jitter and phase noise that could be very confusing, especially uh, for the beginners. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about jitter measurement and intentional jitter as, as part of this talk, and then I summarize. So, jitter essentially is another word for another word for timing uncertainty, and as you know, uh, jitter perhaps or timing uncertainty has been with us as long as time has been. So, whenever we talk about the time, there's timing uncertainty, and in this case, I'm showing you um, um, an hourglass, or also known as a sand glass, that is used as a stopwatch. In fact, some of my colleagues have this. This is quite handy. It's got 15 minutes time. And when you're going to meet with somebody, especially students who want to spend a lot of time, you may say that they have 15 minutes and you would just let it go. So this is supposed to measure 15 minutes, but obviously there's some uncertainty. Uh, this is the sand that is going to drop through the hole and the sands are all not of the same shape and form. And, and so there is a few seconds that you may go wrong. It's not exactly 15 minutes. And this is the timing uncertainty. Obviously, in this case, the timing uncertainty is caused because the grains of sands are a different shape, and you don't know how they're exactly going to line up at the hole when they're dropped. So this is the cause of uh, timing uncertainty. If you look at the electronic version of this on the right, instead of sand, we're using electrons now. And instead of that bucket that is going to be filled with sand, we're using a capacitor. So here we have a DC current I that is going to fill up the capacitor. And the idea is that we like to charge up the capacitor to a point where the voltage across the capacitor is going to be equal or surpasses the threshold voltage. And that would be uh, the stop time for us. So if I, if I just look at this uh, quickly, I would say that I need to uh, wait for a time that is C times V threshold, which is the charge, divided by, by the current. So the time it takes for me to um, to charge up that capacitor to the threshold voltage is CVT uh, or CVTH divided by I. Now, again, I is supposed to be a DC current, but, but in this case, the DC current could also have some noise or some, um, some additional electrons, if you wish, that is going to come and, and change that current. So the flow of current will be different depending on how noisy is that current source. And accordingly, the time that it will take to charge that will be different. So again, this is an electronic version of that exact sand glass that we talked about. Now, timing uncertainty obviously exists everywhere. So for example, this tutorial is supposed to be an hour and 30 minutes, 90 minutes, but I cannot guarantee that it's going to be finishing exactly on this. In this case, I may be adapting my speech. Maybe I will go a bit slowly at the beginning and then cheat essentially, and then I make sure that I will finish on time. But in real life, if I want to go at the same pace, it's very hard to predict the exact 90 minutes. So that's another example of uh, timing uncertainty. Obviously, timing uncertainty exists in a lot of applications that we're dealing in electronics. But I want to just bring you uh, one example of effect of jitter in wireline. This is just because it's so close to my work. So here, what I'm showing you, a block diagram of a transmitter and a receiver that is separated by a channel, which is a piece of wire. As you can see, what we are trying to do in this wireline system is that taking the data and we clock it, and that data that we are planning to send is going to go through the channel. There's a termination resistor, RT, uh, just to make sure there's not much reflections. And then we send that through the channel 
Uh, the channel is going to attenuate the signal, perhaps, and it's going to be frequency-dependent attenuation, and then we'll arrive at the receiver. At the receiver, we want to count for that attenuation, so there's an equalizer at the front end, followed by clock recovery and, and uh, the slicing action at the end, or decision circuit. Now, if you look at this circuit, uh, you see a bunch of um, red arrows that I've shown. This is the places where jitter is going to affect um, the performance of this uh, wireline transceiver. Uh, we start with the clock, and that's what we just talked about in the previous slide. The clock generation is supposed to provide you with an ideal clock with exact timing of the rising edge of the clock. But because of jitter or timing uncertainty, this clock is going to move a little bit back and forth, perhaps by a few uh, femtoseconds or hundreds of femtoseconds. And what happens is that as a result, the data that you will get at the output as a, at the driver is going to not be precisely equal timing for each data bit. Some data bits may be a bit longer, some data bits may be slightly shorter. This is what we refer as to unit interval. The unit interval is going to deviate from um, ideal values. So this is the starting point. We're sending the data, and the data has jitter in it. And then, of course, uh, the, the uh, termination resistance RT is connected to the VDD. And as you know, your VDD is connected to so many other electronic parts, and they're going to create noise. And that's what we refer to as VDD noise. The VDD noise is going to add to your signal, at least influence your signal to go up and down a little bit in the voltage domain. But that moving up and down in the voltage domain is going to move the zero crossing of the data. And so you're adding extra jitter to your data. The data goes through the channel. The channel is passive. You would expect there's no noise, perhaps. But the fact is that your data has a pattern, and your channel has a frequency response. As a result, the zero crossings will be influenced by the channel characteristic. So not all zero, depending on the pattern, um, the zero crossings may go a bit faster or slower than usual. And therefore, you will have additional jitter in the zero crossing of your data as it arrives at the receiver. The receiver has its own termination and its own VDD, and that adds extra noise to this. So again, you one more time are going to tamper with the timing of your data. Then you go through an equalizer, and obviously the equalizer is another filter. Every time you go through a filter, not only will you impact the voltage domain uh, characteristic of the signal, but also the timing of it. So there will be additional case of jitter added. Then we go through clock recovery. The clock recovery, as my colleague will go through in detail later, you will see that in clock recovery, there's, of course, the jitter generation by the local uh, oscillator that you have in the system. So you're creating a clock to sample the data, but that clock also has its own jitter. And when you look at this entire picture, you see the data is being plagued by jitter at different places, left and right. And so this is what is going to happen as a result of jitter. And of course, in wireline, what we're really interested in at the end of the day is that I want to send the data, and I would like to make sure that I would detect it perfectly at the end without much error. So what we measure, a measure of performance for us is bit error rate. The lower the bit error rate is, the better. What happening because of jitter is that we start observing more and more bits of being error at the end. And so that is going to impact our bit error rate. So in summary, what we are observing here is that we like to study jitter because jitter is the main contributor to bit error rate in the wireline system. I have uh, shown this same concept using eye diagram in wireline. As you can see on the left, I'm showing an eye, a data eye essentially is that they received, they received the waveform, which is a bunch of bits. If you try to uh, wrap it around and put it on top of each other for every UI, then you will get that eye diagram. And you can see all the ones are lining up together at the very top. All the zeros are lining up at the bottom. And there's a good separation between ones and zeros. But when you have jitter in the system, you get, this, you get the eye diagram on the right. And this is where uh, you see a lot of dots in the eye. And of course, the distinction between one and zero starts to merge into each other. And you could not see that distinction very well anymore. And this is an example where of course, you can make a mistake. A one can be taken as a zero, and a zero can be taken as a one. And this is how the bit error rate is being affected by jitter. So this is what we like to address in this talk and the remainder of the talks um, in this series. Um, if you 
think that bit error rate is a measure of performance in the wireline, the corresponding in the data converters is going to be uh, the signal to noise ratio. Whenever we're using uh, data converters, the purpose is to take data, for example, from analog domain and bring it to digital domain. But in doing so, we do not want to add much noise. We like to maintain a high signal to noise ratio. But the fact is that as soon as you go through, for example, an ADC, the example I'm showing here is a two bit ADC, you take the signal that is a continuous waveform, analog waveform, and you're, you're pushing this to ADC, you get two bits at the output. Obviously, the two bits only creates four levels, but your input signal had many levels. It was a continuous signal and it was analog voltage. So the error between the two, the difference between the analog signal that you put as an input and the digital that you get at the output is what is called quantization error. You're getting this error because you're trying to quantize it to only four levels. And that quantization error is shown again uh, on the right here, on the top right. Uh, if I want to look at the quality of my ADC, I can say what is, what is the ratio of the signal power to the quantization noise power? And that is what is known as SNR or, or signal to noise ratio. I've added an index or a subscript Q to refer to it as just due to quantization noise only. And the reason is that if you just look at the second item, which is related to jitter, assume that the clock that is sampling your ADC is not perfect at its, at its ideal position, and it's going to deviate a little bit. If it happens, uh, instead of, uh, for example, observing the red um, step, you will observe the blue steps. And the difference between those two is what is shown at the right, which is the, now the error due to jitter. So this is essentially noise that you're creating, that you're adding to your signal, and it's going to affect your signal to noise ratio the same way as a quantizer or quantization error was causing um, signal to noise ratio to go down. So I can now redefine my SNR due to this timing this, um, um, uncertainty and I would identify that SNR sub tau and that would be again the power of the signal due to the power of jitter noise. That is the noise caused by jitter. Obviously at the end of the day you have both of the noises. You have the quantization noise and you have timing uncertainty because of jitter and they would together work to lower your SNR. But this is again a topic that my colleague Nicola Dadalt is going to cover in the second part of, of this um, tutorial. Now, if jitter is the timing uncertainty, then phase noise essentially is the phase uncertainty. So we see in wireline application, we're looking at mainly baseband uh, signaling when you're dealing with a clock and you're dealing with a clock that perhaps we may think is a kind of a square wave clock. But as soon as you move into the realm of um, wireless, you're talking about narrow band or pass band, and then you're dealing with frequencies. In fact, your clock uh, could be considered to be almost like a sinusoid. And of course, your data, in a sense, is a type of sinusoid, so because you're looking at a very narrow fr uh, frequency. And in that case, what you observe is that it's not just the jitter uh, that is defined, uh, as we'll see, at the rising edge of the clock, but that jitter um, manifests itself as a phase noise or phase deviation, or as you call it later, excess phase throughout the, the entire signal. And that is going to impact, um, in this case, the performance, which is again characterized by SNR. What I'm showing you here is uh, a case where uh, we have a wireless transmitter sitting next to a, a wireless receiver. But the, the, but the transmitter, for example, could be an uplink transmitter when it's sending it in one band, whereas the receiver is receiving the downlink, which is a different band, but they may be close to each other in terms of frequency. And now because the oscillator or the local oscillator that is sitting at the edge of the, uh, the, uh, the transmit band has a, a lot of phase noise or impurity, that excess phase noise shows up as, as some part of this spectrum of the, of the oscillator um, leaking essentially into the RX band. So you're essentially leaking into your receiver part of the signal that was not supposed to be there. And obviously that is going to add to the noise and is going to impact the uh, signal to noise ratio. This is the topic when we're moving from jitter to phase noise. And this is going to be covered, as far as the oscillator is concerned, is gonna be covered by uh, uh, my colleague Piero Andriani, and as far as the application in wireless is going to be done by Antonio Lissidini.
So I hope this has uh, motivated you to listen to the rest of this tutorial and do not leave early um, in this case. So now let us uh, move to the rest of the material and I'm going to start with the formal definition of what is jitter. We start with the definition of absolute jitter. This is the term that we need to use and you hear me talking about it a lot myself and later throughout the day. So absolute jitter is defined as follows. Imagine that you have an ideal clock. An ideal clock is shown on the top. What we, what we think about ideal clock in this case is actually look like a square wave. Obviously, it's periodic. And what is happening is that the distance or the uh, places where the rising edge happens is exactly happening at the right time. And the right time for us is multiples of the same period. So the clock is happening exactly in a quite regular way. The timing is uh, such that the, uh, the interval between two rising edges is constant across the entire waveform. So in other words, we know exactly where the rising edge should be. But you look at the jittery clock that is shown at the bottom, you see the rising edge is moving with respect to the ideal location. Now, obviously, the falling edge also moves, but we are concentrating only here on the rising edge of the clock for simplicity. So if you look at the rising edge, rising edge sometimes is early. In fact, in the first um, instance, you can see the rising edge ar arrived a little bit earlier than ideal clock. And then in the second uh, rising edge, the second rising edge comes a little bit later. The third rising edge may come also later. The fourth one may be a bit earlier. But in any case, they're always around that nominal or ideal location, except there's some deviation. This is what we call absolute jitter. So absolute jitter in this case is defined as the timing deviation between a jitter clock and an ideal clock, and is only defined at the rising edge of the clock in this case, or at this discrete time. Because this, if you, and essentially if you try to draw this, you will see that absolute jitter as a function of time is defined well at the rising edge of the clock, and I'm showing it as A0, that, that's correspond to the timing deviation at time 0, then A1, timing deviation at time T1, and then A2 at time T2, and, and so on. Now, as such, the absolute jitter looks like uh, a discrete time signal, but it's also a random signal, because as we will see later, we cannot predict what those values are. So in essence, what we're defining, we're defining a discrete time random signal we identify this as AK in this presentation. That's a capital, I'm uh, sorry, that's a bold face A to represent a random signal as opposed to a deterministic signal. And as you can see, AK is defined as TK, which is the, the rising edge or the kth rising edge of the jitter clock minus the place it should be, which is K times T. So that is defined as absolute jitter. Now you may say, wow, this is, really not very useful because we never have ideal clock in real life. Any clock that we have is jittery. So why are we defining something that is absolute? This is an abstract concept. In fact, this is the same, maybe you could ask the same question that why are we defining ideal voltage source? Because in real life, there is no ideal voltage source. But the fact is that we all know if you have an ideal voltage source, and in fact, you have an ideal resistor, and you put them together, you can really model exactly how a practical voltage source might behave. The same way as you will see soon, this absolute jitter provides us a means for us to define all sorts of jitter that we deal with later on. So in fact, this is just immediately after this, we talk now about relative jitter. So what is relative jitter? Relative jitter obviously is dealing with two clocks that are both jittery, and we are looking at the deviation between the two. So timing difference between two non-ideal clocks is defined as relative jitter. It makes sense, it's relative to each other, how much deviation do they have? And in fact, you can um, see here, we're using a notation R sub K. Uh, again, we're using both phase R because we want to emphasize this is a random signal. RK is defined as TK of clock one minus TK of clock two. But if you just manipulate this equation, you can easily see that this is equal to absolute jitter of clock one minus absolute value of uh, absolute jitter of clock two. So immediately you can see this is one way for us to understand relative jitter. Relative jitter is really the difference between two absolute jitters. You can just imagine you have an ideal clock and you measure both of them with respect to ideal clock and then you find the difference of those absolute jitters and that will become relative jitter. Uh, the question you may ask, okay, this is now useful, but where do we use this? Where is why relative jitter is important? 
In fact, in the application that I just mentioned to you about Waterline, at the front end, you're trying to get the data and you're trying to sample it with a clock. Or if you have a PLL, you have a reference clock and you have a clock that's coming from the VCO. Is whenever two clocks meet, and these two clocks both are non-ideal, and of course one clock wants to, let's say, measure or sample the data, and if it samples at the wrong time, the timing here doesn't matter what is the ideal time. What is important is that if the data moves, for example, the clock moves with it. So it's the relative jitter that matters here because that could cause error, not the absolute jitter in this case. So again, we'll have a lot more to talk about this when we go to the next presentation by uh, Nicola Dadal. Another um, concept here is period jitter. So again, there's all sorts of jitter that we could define and they all find their use in depending on the application you look at it. Period jitter, as the name suggests, or also called cycle jitter, is defined as difference between edge to edge interval, which I would put in brackets as period, um, versus the, nor the nominal period. So the idea is that if you have a clock, it's supposed to be periodic anyways, but if you have jitter, technically speaking, that's no longer periodic because the period is supposed to be fixed. So I'm using the term nominal period to refer to that ideal clock, but then I use uh, the term edge to edge interval or so-called instantaneous period to refer to this. And then the idea is that if I look at this case uh, of uh, the jittery clock, you can see that the period, or again, in this case, the interval, first interval is T0, the next one is T1, the third one is T2. And again, these are going to be different than the ideal value of T. We just go ahead and define the difference between each period, in this case, for example, T0 and T, right? Or T1 minus T, or T2 minus T. This is also providing us with a discrete time random sequence, except that this random sequence refers to deviation from ideal period or from nominal period in this, in this case. So that's where we're, we're, we're using PK uh, for period jitter. And you can see that, again, if I write PK as the interval between two adjacent uh, rising edge, that is TK plus one minus T, and I, sub and I subtract T from it, capital T, then essentially I can show that this is equivalent to, again, finding the difference between two absolute jitters. In this case, is the difference equation, right? AK plus one minus AK. So it's like finding the derivative of absolute jitter is what rises or what gives rise to uh, period jitter. Where do we use period jitter? Period jitter is very useful in digital circuits when you need, you're supposed to finish a task in certain time. For example, in a microprocessor, you may say, I want to allocate one clock cycle for addition or two clock cycle perhaps for a, a multiplication. A floating point might take three clock cycles. So you I, I already identifying what's important for you is the clock cycle. And if there's jitter in that clock cycle, it means that you're going to end some of the cycles early before the task is finished. And that is going to cause error for you. So period jitter is important for us, especially in digital circuits when the task is defined for a previous period of time. So we can extend this period jitter to end period jitter. So if I, if I define the period jitter as a difference between adjacent edges or the time between adjacent edges and the, and the nominal period, I could go and say, let's skip some of the edges and I just go for end period and look at the interval between not two adjacent rising edge, but, but n adjacent rising edge. And I look at the, that interval and I subtract nt from it and find out what is that jitter. And immediately, you, again, you ask yourself, why, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to go from period jitter to end period jitter? The answer is that there are cases where we're really not interested in every edge. We're only interested in the every nth edge. Example of that is a, is a frequency divider. When you're trying to divide a frequency uh, by, let's say, a factor of eight, you're looking essentially at one eighth, uh, one eighth interval, not every interval or not every rising edge. And so in that case, what really matters at the end when you divide the clock by a factor of eight, what you observe at the end is really the jitter in the original signal, except that observed at every eighth interval, not at every interval. So this is what end period jitter becomes important. Again, as you can see, uh, period, uh, end period jitter essentially becomes the difference between uh, two absolute jitters. Now, so far, what we talked about was about clock and jitter, and it's true. 
jitter is mainly deal dealing with the clock, but we also deal with the data, and data has its own jitter, as I, I show here. So imagine that you have a flip-flop, and or you can call it a retimer, at the, at the beginning of a circuit. When you have the input data coming in, you have a jitter clock, and all you're trying to do is capture the data with this jitter clock. And in that case, you can see that the uh, jitter clock, which is, uh, which is which we already defined, is going to cause uh, retime data to have different unit intervals. As we said, unit interval is defined as the time for one bit or one data that is going to be transferred. But that unit interval is going to now be changed, for example, because of period jitter. Because if you have different, if you have period jitter, every data unit is going to be different than the adjacent data units, perhaps. And this is what is causing data to have jitter as its edge. But remember, data is not like clock. You may have data that is constant, that doesn't change at every clock value or every clock period. So in that case, what we're observing is somewhat jitter, but it's not observable at every unit interval. But the fact is that if you now take all the data and you show it in an eye diagram, the combination of all those jitter that you could observe will give you a feel for how much jitter there is in the data. In fact, this is what we will use later. Um, data also has an in another interesting property, and that is is causing data-dependent jitter. So data-dependent jitter is exactly uh, what we talked in the context of wireline. If you imagine that the signal is going through the channel, and let's assume that the data that you're sending is perfect, there is no jitter in the data. But by virtue of going through the channel, the channel is frequency dependent. And what happens is that depending on how many consecutive ones or zero you have, or how much activity you have in the data, the zero crossing will move slightly depending on the data pattern. So every data pattern is going to move the zero crossing by a different amount. So this is going to cause at the end, if you look at the end result, you have a data with the zero crossing moves depending on the data pattern. And this is what we know it as uh, data-dependent jitter. This data-dependent jitter, unlike what we discussed so far, which is random jitter, is actually deterministic. It's deterministic because if you know the data pattern, you can actually predict exactly what that jitter may be or what the characteristic may be. In fact, we also talk about this later, but this is also bounded. So it's not like a random jitter that could be Gaussian and could go um, far away. So, let me just now um, go to the basic of eye diagram to show you some of the concepts that we discussed. So on the uh, left, I'm showing you a data I. Again, it's a data I, but it's centered around zero crossing. You can imagine this was many zero crossings all, all uh, put on top of each other, wrapped around and, and plotted. And you can see the one on the left, uh, the zero crossings is happening all in the middle of the I in this case, or the, I guess I should say exactly at that time equal 0.5 ui, except that there's some deviation. So it's not really no jitter. There's some jitter, but that jitter is very limited in its movement. It's just uh, mostly uh, there's no jitter, but there's some, some jitter around that place. If it was uh, ideal clock and it was, or ideal data and there was no jitter, what you need to observe is essentially a delta function at the middle. All of the zero crossings are exactly at the same point. But as you can see, in this case, we're deviating from that ideal location. If you look at the one on the right, when we are showing a random jitter in this case, a, a Gaussian uh, case, the zero crossing is now have a spectrum. It's just got a, it, it, it's a range that it moves. And in that range, if you look at the histogram, you see a Gaussian function. So this is an example where, uh, in fact, we had random jitter in, in the data, and by observing this and maybe counting or binning these random jitter, we can see a Gaussian shape appears. Obviously, if it is Gaussian, if you observe this longer, you will be observed more of the tail that may not show up in this figure. But that's a case for uh, an unb unbound, um, sorry, unbounded jitter. This is in contrast with uh, bounded or deterministic jitter, as I mentioned. Uh, deterministic jitter, I provide you just two examples. Again, we'll go into more details, and you'll see some of these in, in the next talk. And that is uh, sinusoidal jitter and uh, ISI-induced jitter. So th these are essentially covered in what we already talked about, data-dependent jitter. But let me just talk about on the sinusoidal jitter. So when we're trying to characterize our wireline system, we often want to know how robust they are to jitter. And in that case, 
we apply sinusoidal jitter simply because we can replicate it, we can repeat it again. If it was fully random, then you will not be able to replicate the result. So when we're using a sinusoidal jitter, it's deterministic because we know exactly that the zero crossing is moved with a sine function, and we know the frequency of that sine function, so we can easily reproduce it. And then we want to know how much we can go and how much our design can tolerate that jitter in this case. So in this case, we apply the sinusoidal jitter, and as you can see, again, the zero crossing has a range uh, that is shown in time, perhaps between uh, 0.4 and 0.6 in that range. But the histogram is not uniform, and it's not Gaussian, but it's histogram of a sinusoid. As you know, sinusoid has a property that in its peak is going to spend more time because it has zero derivative, right? At its peak, it's, it's going to linger at its peak more than it, that it lingers at its, its own zero crossing. And so you can see that this histogram has two peaks that correspond to the peak of the sinusoid, but in the middle of that eye, when the middle of the zero crossing, there is less because there is less time for jitter to stay in, in that case. Again, I talked about the uh, data-dependent jitter, and uh, that's one shown on the right. The distinction between data-dependent jitter versus random jitter is that data-dependent is discrete in values. It's not, it's not a continuum when you see the jitter movement, but because the number of patterns that you get is finite, the number of possibilities that you see in zero-crossing movement is also finite. Okay, so I think we already talked a lot about jitter and the basic definition, and I think we've covered it all. So it's now time for us to sit back and say, okay, now we understand what the definition of jitter is, but then how do we go ahead and, and characterize or classify jitter? And so that is the next part. Uh, so we said that jitter, whether it's absolute jitter, relative jitter, period jitter, or period jitter, is all the discrete time random signal. There are different forms of discrete time random signal. And, and how do we characterize jitter essentially is how we characterize a random signal. And already you know uh, through the courses you've taken that we have one of the three methods to characterize a random signal. One, the very basic concept is through a statistics. We can draw the histogram of those numbers, essentially look at the bunch of data. We draw the histogram, and through the histogram we can see what is the mean, what is RMS, what is peak to peak, and, and other properties. But then the statistics is just about data. It doesn't really talk about the timing behavior of the random signal. The random signal uh, may be fast changing, may be slow changing. It may be correlated, it may be uncorrelated. And so this is when we look at the time domain. And for time domain, as you know, uh, the way to characterize a random signal is using autocorrelation function. And then this could, be, this could reveal information about how fast the signal is changing, even though it's random. And if you take the Fourier transform of that autocorrelation function, you get the power spectral density. So power spectral density and autocorrelation essentially are giving you the same information, but in two different domains. So we're going to look at these one at a time. So first, let's look at the jitter histogram. This is um, uh, very clear. So what we do is we look at our clock, let's say, and we collect a bunch of jitter data. So in this case, in this example, I'm using 10,000 samples. So essentially, I have 10,000 numbers in a range that is, in this case, is between, let's say, minus 22 picosecond or 20 to 20 uh, picosecond. And we try to bin them in every picosecond. We ask ourselves, how many of these jitter, or how many of these numbers are happening in every picosecond? And we plot this, and that will give us the, the histogram of, of this. So in this case, uh, you know, the histogram looks like it's kind of tilted a little bit to the left. There's, in fact, an extreme case where there's some jitter happening at minus 20 picoseconds, but overall you can get a feel for what is the jitter of, of this clock. And then, of course, you can go ahead and calculate the mean RMS and peak-to-peak -peak value in this case. So just uh, showing you another graph on the next slide, which is um, you know, a generic histogram. And if you have a generic histogram, uh, you can find the sample mean. Uh, by, by just finding the average of, of all of those. And again, the sample mean is defined as the average of all the jitter values that you have, sigma of all the jk's. In this case, j could be replaced for the absolute jitter or period jitter, whichever jitter that you're dealing with, you can find it. Also, you can find the median. Median is defined as the jitter value for which half of the jitter happens 
below it and half of the jitter cases happen above it, and that is can, can be defined. You can find sample variance, which as usual, and also peak-to-peak -peak value um, as shown in this figure. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that we are, what we are calling these, we don't call this mean or median, we call them sample mean, sample median, is because when you're observing 10,000 samples, you're only observing it for one time. If you repeat this experiment another time, you get another 10,000 and you will get another mean. Obviously, we expect those means to be similar, but the idea is that they're not identical. And so you have to be careful about the usage of the term. We're using sample mean and sample average for this. Now, in fact, this brings me up to the next point, which is, uh, okay, is this, how is different than the uh, PDF or probability density function uh, that we could use for jitter? We said already that jitter is probabilistic, so we might as well use the PDF. And what's the difference between PDF and histogram? Essentially, I would say that they're the same, except for one fundamental difference between the two. The fundamental difference is that when you look at histogram, the histogram really based on one realization over time. We said we look at 10,000 samples. That's just one realization of jitter that you've observed, right? So that's what we do. We just take 10,000 samples. So essentially you have one uh, realization and then you will do all the averaging on time. Whereas when you talk about PDF, you, you are staying at one fixed time and you looked at many realizations that is happening at the same time. So in other words, you're looking at jitter that could have possibly happened at this time. You observe one value, but this could have been another value. In fact, if you have a different realization of the same circuit, you may observe a different value of jitter. So whereas the histogram looks at one waveform and does the time averaging, the PDF looks, uh, looks at one instant and looks at many an ensemble of cases. In reality, and because of the cases that we're dealing with are all ergodic processes, and as you know, in ergodic processes, uh, the time average and the ensemble average, or the statistical average in time versus ensemble are, are the same, there's really no difference between the two, but in general, that, that difference does exist. So the other difference, of course, is, is semantic, is that we have to make sure that the area under PDF should be one. So it's not just a count, it's normalized to the area of one. Uh, but nevertheless, the histogram and PDF kind of have the same shape if you scale them uh, properly. And here's uh, some examples of histogram. Um, um, I'm showing you on the left, jitter as a function of time. Remember, this is always a, a, a kind of a barrier to entry for people who have not worked with jitter initially. And that is jitter itself is time, but we also represent it as a function of time. So the, the difference between the two is that the vertical axis is deviation in time, and horizontal axis is the running time as you move forward. So this is shown time as a function of time. Now, if I look at the histogram of this uh, for the first example on the very top, I see this is a Gaussian distribution. Essentially, I don't really care about time here. I, I just look at the data values. It just happened to be shown as a function of time, but I have a bunch of data I'm only looking at the vertical axis and I see I have data of these values and then I look at the histogram and that's what's shown on the right for a Gaussian. Uh, the one in the middle, in fact, is uniform. Again, you do not observe the uniformity in time. If you look at voltage domain, you see that any value between minus five and five is represented equally in, in that uh, form and that's why it's, it's uniform and shown in the uh, right middle. Uh, the one at the bottom is sinusoidal jitter. Again, sinusoidal jitter looks like this in time domain, but if you just look at the voltage domain, and, uh, or sorry, the vertical axis, and you ask yourself, what is the proportion of jitter in each interval of, of, the, of the time, then you bin it, you'll find out the sinusoidal would have a histogram that has two peaks corresponding to the two peaks of the sinusoid and very low when you have a zero crossing. Um, if you... I, I've so far tried to concentrate on one jitter at a time, not to make things complicated, but in reality, jitters, of course, are going to be present at all time. It's not going, the data dependent jitter is not going to say, well, because you have random jitter in you, I'm not going to interfere, or the VDD noise is not going to, to wait for anybody else. All of them are going to be combined. So the jitter that you will see is more than some of two or three jitter sources that are often coming from totally different sources and they add up. But this is something you have to have in mind, and that is jitter is a random signal. And if you have 
sources of different forms that are coming to add together, essentially you have this summation of multiple random signals. And as you know, when you add up random sequences or random signal, uh, the PDF of the resultant random signal is going to be the convolution of the PDF of the individual components. And this is what I'm showing here. So on the, on the top, you see the uh, PDF of um, two types of jitter that have been combined or exist together. One is a Dirac delta function, and one is a Gaussian. So if you have a Dirac, that means you just have jitter at this place and this place, only two places, right? But then if you have Gaussian, you have something in the middle. If you add them together, this is going to be convolved. And so you see two humps in this case. It seems like two Gaussians that are separated from each other. If you get sinusoidal jitter and mix it with Gaussian, again, sinusoidal jitter uh, is the one that is shown in the uh, uh, dash line in this case. It has two peaks. It's not exactly direct, direct delta, but it's two peaks corresponding to the peak of the sinusoids. If you mix that with a Gaussian, then you get the one in the middle, uh, which is shown in solid black. And finally, uniform. Uniform, of course, is the one that is shown again in dotted line. And then if you mix that with Gaussian, you're essentially going to expand the Gaussian from both ends, and that is what you will get. If you combine these and you want to see this in the eye diagram, it looked like this. So uh, this is a case where we combine DCD, that is duty cycle distortion. If you have duty cycle distortion in a clock, uh, that will result in a data that has different periods for each data uh, interval. And that is showing up as uh, you know, two occurrences because depending on the data happened during the uh, time when the clock was high or clock was low, you will get different intervals. And that is going to cause a jitter that is shown uh, at the bottom in terms of um, the histogram. And of course, the eye diagram is the one that's shown on the top. But you can see around each of these DCDs or Dirac delta functions, there's another distribution. And that is the RJ or random jitter or Gaussian jitter that is convolved already with this. So bottom line is that when we're observing jitter, remember it's not just one top, there's several top, and you, it's your job or my job to decipher what they are. But let me put these things in perspective of what we just said so far. So if you look at jitter, there's this concept of, okay, we just don't care what type is just jitter. And so we ask often this question, what is the total jitter? And the total jitter is the jitter that is coming from all different sources combined. And at the end of the day, we are interested in what is the peak to peak of that jitter. But remember, if the jitter is Gaussian, the peak to peak is infinity. And we can never find, I mean, it's just useless. Well, of course, peak to peak is infinity. But then we define it in the context of bit error rate. We will limit the peak to peak depending on how probable it is to occur. So for example, I say, I'm interested in a bit error of 10 to the minus 12. So corresponding to the 10 minus 10 to the minus 12, I could go that far in the Gaussian to make sure that the probability of occurring anything beyond that would be less than 10 to the minus 12. And so that is how we limit this. But this is true for the random jitter, but of course there is uh, the uh, deterministic jitter that is bounded and there's all of this combined. So here in this diagram I'm showing total jitter is really can be um, um, classified as deterministic jitter, DJ, and the characteristic of all of these is that they're bounded, and then RJ, which is unbounded, and that's the Gaussian jitter. Deterministic jitter itself, or jitter, could also be uh, classified as being correlated, and I'm showing this at the bottom row, uh, correlated or uncorrelated. What I mean by this is that sometimes the jitter that you have is really correlated with the data. So you have a data in the wireline, and that data is causing data-dependent jitter, that jitter obviously is correlated with your data. Um, or you have DCD. DCD obviously is coming from the data, so that is, again, uh, correlated. There's also SJ. This is uh, uh, the sinusoidal jitter. Sinusoidal jitter is what we add to the system. It's nothing to do with the data, so it's uncorrelated with the data, and hence it's categorized as such. You have bounded, uncorrelated jitter that could be periodic jitter. The jitter coming from VDD, for example, is uncorrelated. Um, and also RJ typically is nothing to do with the data. So this is the way you can char char characterize or classify all sorts of jitter. And again, it's important for us to know what is, if the jitter is correlated or uncorrelated, is because as you know, when you're adding correlated jitter, um, their sigma may just add up. But when you're, um, sorry, if you do correlated, their sigma may just add up linearly. But when you're dealing with uncorrelated, 
uh, the sigma squared of variances are going to add up linearly. So I mentioned that jitter uh, comes, uh, the jitter histogram may have a combination, and I'm showing a little bit more complicated example here that we observe, and that is uh, a jitter that looks like the black originally. And what we like to do is that we like to model this jitter because we like to go ahead and simulate the rest of the circuit with this. And the question is that what is this jitter? Now, at the first glance, and again, it's not shown on this slide, but you could use your imagination, that uh, at the first glance, I can say, well, it does look like a Gaussian, just one Gaussian, but of course with a blip in the middle. And I could create that Gaussian, and I can try my best to match that Gaussian model to this. But what, and what happens is that, yes, you get something that looks similar, but the problem is the tails. And the devil is in the tails in these cases. Because if you want to measure with good accuracy what is the probability of those tails happening, you have to have a very good match. Otherwise, you will get uh, a big error in this case. So if uh, you look at the um, diagram that I'm showing you here, uh, we, we know for a fact that the jitter that is coming and happening in Waraline is actually a combination of two. One is a deterministic jitter that is happening in the middle and is bounded. And then there's also Gaussian jitter that is convolved with this. But what is interesting is that this Gaussian jitter, which is at the two end, they show a bit of different behavior. And for this purpose, we decide to use two different Gaussian functions and fit it to this data. So those two fitting uh, Gaussian, one is shown in red, the other one is shown in blue. And what we're really trying to do is to match the tails. Once you match the tails, then the middle would be the, the remaining one is the deterministic jitter that you could easily find and replace it here. Um, what I, what I want to add here is that the Gaussian function that you see in the left and right are not exactly Gaussian PDF. They are being scaled by a factor which is AL for the amplitude on the left and AR for the amplitude that is on the, on the right. And the reason why we're using two different amplitudes is because we're not going to use this Gaussian as a whole uh, jitter PDF. Otherwise, the area of, under that should be 1, and then maybe that will put a constraint on A. But in this case, we're just trying to model, so we add this extra parameter in our um, optimization in order to find what you can see on the right. So on the right, you can see essentially the equivalent of a cumulative distribution function, or CDF, one for uh, the case where the jitter is less than x and one for jitter larger than x. And then you try to match those, and you'll see that these two Gaussian really match the two tails relatively well. And also, it's interesting to observe that um, the sigma of the two left and right end up being the same. And this is because the underlying principle that is causing that random jitter on the left and right is the same. It's just as they've been really uh, moved around by that deterministic jitter that is happening in the middle. I have a little bit more information on this on the next slide when, in fact, we try to put numerical values to this. And again, the idea is to calculate total jitter. As I mentioned already, the total jitter should be defined in the context of uh, what is uh, the bit error rate. So if you go for a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 12, then what you would say is that total jitter essentially is deterministic jitter peak to peak plus random jitter peak to peak. The, total, uh, the deterministic jitter peak to peak is clear. It's deterministic and we can find it. But for random jitter is the one that we resort to, for example, 7 sigma that may correspond to a uh, bit area of 10 to the minus 12. And so in this case, we find out that the total jitter peak to peak will be equal to 19.3 picosecond. OK, so that was all the definitions and basics and classification of jitter. Now let us move into uh, an example of uh, when jitter manifests itself and how it's being produced. I want to start this with a very simple example of ring oscillator. But remember, there's going to be a full an hour and a half talk by uh, my colleague, uh, P uh, Piero Andriani, who's going to talk about phase noise in oscillators in general. But this is just to warm you up and, and to provide as a basic concepts in this. So as you, you're all familiar with the ring oscillators, in this case, I'm using a ring oscillator using three invert inverters. And as you know, it is the delay of the inverters that is causing the oscillation. Essentially, you need to have a six propagation delay for these inverters uh, to create uh, a period of a waveform that is shown as a clock. So the output of every inverter you look essentially is a clock signal or a periodic signal, and they're just being delayed uh, by the propagation delay of the inverter. And of course, you have to go twice around the loop in order to create this. 
Um, so typically in this case, we say that the period of this is six TPD. TPD is a propagation delay through one inverter, and you need six of those to create one period of the signal. But the trouble is um, that this TPD, or the nominal propagation delay, has its own deviation. And the reason is the circuit's shown. So if I'm showing you the inverter as a typical CMOS, you have NMOS pull down, PMOS pull up, and you have a capacitor, uh, typically we, uh, we would model the NMOS transistor, which is the pull down as a current source. Uh, of course, that current source could be time dependent, but you have a current source that is going to pull the charge away from the capacitor uh, in the, uh, that I'm showing in the middle, but that current source is not going to be uh, a fixed deterministic value. Of course, there's a deterministic component of it, and that's the nominal current that you produce. But in addition, there's a the thermal noise of that capacitor, and there are other noise that, that exists that will change that current. And this is going back to that hourglass example that we talked about, or the, equi the electronic equivalent, that if you are changing the flow of current randomly, you're going to get a different propagation delay accordingly. The same thing goes for the, for the uh, pull-up. The pull-up, of course, can be modeled using a deterministic current source as a function of time, but there is noise component that is going to change this. So essentially, when we look at the inverter and we look at the propagation delay, we can say the propagation delay nominally is this value, but then it has a deviation, and every time you use an inverter, you will have a different delay. Of course, it's going to be slightly more or less. So we call this excess delay not the nominal delay plus some excess delay. And in fact, this excess delay could easily be modeled as um, in this form that I'm showing here. So if you look at cycle N of your clock that you're generating, cycle N, let's say you already produce a clock and it has some excess delay already that is inheriting from the cycle N minus one. When you go through, they have three inverters. Each of those inverters is going to add its own excess delay. It's like you're throwing a dice every time and then see how much excess delay are you going to give me this time, and it will give you x1 of n, second one, x2 of n, and x3 of n. So every time that you go through this uh, ring once, you're going to essentially add three new random variables, or essentially you can think of them as random sequence that you're adding. And so essentially at the end of the cycle n, what you get is the summation of many of these random signals that you've added up and you've accumulated over time. So if you look at y of n, which is showing you the uh, excess jitter as a function of time at the end of n cycle, that's equal to what it was at the previous cycle plus x1 of n, x2 of n, x3 of n. Um, and it's reasonable, reasonable to assume that x1 of n is a stationary and uncorrelated, then essentially y of n shows a characteristic of what is known as a, a random walk. And again, uh, just a quick note of a random walk is just when you try to stay at one place, let's say I'm standing here and I have a coin in my hand and I have, if, I, if, if I toss the coin, if it's head, I will just go one step forward. If it's tail, I'll go one step backward and I repeat this experiment. And what I'm showing you here is that the distance from the place where I start as a function of time as I throw more, uh, or, uh, throw more um, coins. And I can see, uh, depending on who are you doing this, in fact, it's easy to do it, but let's say with 10, uh, 10 students uh, standing at the same, uh, same place, and then each of them has its own coin. Some of them will go further up, some will go further down, and each of their trajectory can be shown as a different color in this case. What is interesting is that the expected value for all of them is the same place, assuming that the coin is fair. So with the same probability you go forward, you go backward, and over time, the expected value is going to be zero, or not going to move. Uh, but the deviation is going to increase over time. And it, in fact, the difference between the coin and this random walk and the case of inverter is that we don't have a coin. It's not a binary. The noise that you get is multiple levels, many, many levels that you can get. And so uh, every time that you throw a coin, you're really dealing with a much more complicated random process. But essentially, it's a random walk, except that it's using electrons instead of a coin. Uh, so you can see that in this case, the, the variance of this is growing linearly over time. In fact, it was shown in a classical paper by John McNeil uh, in JSCC 1997. This, is, I believe, is the first person uh, who decided to actually go and measure the jitter in ring oscillators, and he showed the measurements. So I really encourage you to look at this reference perhaps in your own time later. 
but what it's showing is, is the, the notation is using a sigma p. Sigma p in this case essentially is the um, uh, jitter variation uh, or, or the variant or the deviation of jitter as a function of time. N is a number of clock cycles. So what he's saying is that the standard deviation of jitter when you when you observe it after n cycle is equal to the standard deviation at the end of the first one times root of n. So the deviation grows with root of n, and he shows this experimentally, but of course we have the mathematical proof for it. Now if you take the log of these, the both sides, you'll find out the log of this standard deviation is, is essentially, if you ignore the constant, is equal to half of uh, log of n. So in other words, it grows um, not with n, but root of n, so in log you will have a factor of one, one over two uh, in this case. So the summary here is that the jitter variance is going to increase um, with uh, linearly with time or with n, uh, deviation is going to grow with root of n. Now, when you take this VCO ring oscillator and put it in a PLL, what happens is that you have a reference clock at the PLL, and once you go around the, uh, a ring, and of course you create extra jitter, then you have a place where you can compare it against a reference clock. And this is where you could correct, perhaps, for that jitter, not to allow it to grow indefinitely, because the way I explained it for the jitter of ring oscillator, it could go to infinity as the time goes by. Uh, but if you, if you compare it against something and perhaps reset it, uh, or keep it constant, the time that you cannot really control this is the, the time delayed through the loop. So the jitter essentially grows for as long as you have a loop delay, but then after that you can make it constant. And that is what is shown um, in this diagram. And again, we will see this uh, a bit later. Okay, so we talked a lot about jitter histogram and jitter PDF. We look at the combination of them, classifying them. But the question is now, is jitter histogram or PDF enough for us? And the answer is no. In fact, this is an example that shows why not. Uh, I look at two jitter uh, functions as a function of time, or two uh, jitter samples, let's say. Uh, one is shown in black and one is shown in red. If you look at these, uh, both of them actually are representing a uniform distribution for, P, uh, or for their jitter. So in other words, if you look at the y-axis, ignore the time axis, collapse them all in one place, and you look at the distribution of the black versus red, they both have exactly the same distribution, same PDF. But obviously, they're drastically different in terms of their time behavior. One of them, in fact, you may say is not even random. It's deterministic. You see, you observe the behavior. It's a slow, movie, slow moving signal, and it's predictable. The other one is erratic, going up and down, and uh, you know, with not, uh, not anything that you can predict possibly if it's going to go up and down. What is interesting for you to know is that, in fact, these two graphs are generated from the same. So in other words, all we have done is that we have moved the, uh, the jitter samples in time. And so the original triangular waveform is created the red one. So both of them are the same in terms of a statistics, but they are different in terms of timing behavior. So the question is that how do we capture that timing behavior? How do we characterize that part of the jitter? And again, for most of you who have taken a course in random signals and random processes, you know that the solution lies in um, using autocorrelation function. So we use autocorrelation function of this to find out if jitter is correlated or uncorrelated uh, in this case. So if I want to uh, tell you in advance what's going to come up in this presentation, um, what we're going to do is essentially look at the jitter and we're looking at the autocorrelation function of it, and then we're going to look at uh, the power spectral density, and this is what's going to uh, come up in the next few slides. Uh, but in order to do this, I want to move a little bit uh, away from jitter and going to excess phase. This is important as we're going to talk about um, the relationship, of course, between jitter and phase noise, but more importantly, to expand our definition of jitter. If you remember, we defined jitter as a discrete time uh, signal, right? It was only de de defined at, at the places where the rising edge of the clock uh, exists. Um, if you expand this clock, not to be a rectangular waveform, but let's say it's a sinusoid, and in fact, this is what's happening at high frequencies, then 
you add noise to that sinusoid, that noise is going to cause so-called jitter, but it's actually going to cause jitter not just at the zero crossing. If you think about it, you can see that that noise can actually move the sinusoids back and forth at any time. So this is where we start the concept of excess phase. Excess phase exists at, every, at any time, continuous time, as opposed to just at the rising edge or at the zero crossing of the sinusoids. So in other words, excess phase is just an expanded version of, sorry, excess, yeah, excess phase is an expanded version of the jitter. Jitter is defined as discrete, but if you go and make a superset out of this in the continuous time, then it will become excess phase. And that's what we need to use in order to expand the, this concept into the autocorrelation and the rest. So I already kind of mentioned about this or, uh, to some, some extent. We said jitter is a discrete time a random process and it's only defined at the clock transitions. But if you look at the sinusoid, and that's shown as V of t equal A0 sine of omega 0 t plus N of t, if this is your clock and you're adding a bit of noise to it, you can show, as you will see later, that this could be equivalent of adding a bit of excess phase everywhere in the sinusoid. So in other words, A0 sine of omega 0 t plus N of t can be made equal to, under certain condition, to A0 sine of omega 0 t plus phi of t. This phi of t is the excess phase that we are referring to and we're going to use later. So in other words, excess phase is a continuous time random process as opposed to a discrete time random process. But then what is jitter? Jitter essentially is a, a sampled version of excess phase. If you sample it exactly at the rising edge or at the zero crossing, then we get jitter. Of course, it's a scaled version because as we'll show, you need to divide it by omega zero. You need to multiply omega zero by t to get phase to make it in radians versus t, uh, t which is jitter in seconds. So there's a scaling, a scaled version. There's a scaling factor here, which is omega zero. But aside from that, these two concepts are uh, very similar. So uh, I've added a bit of notes, in fact, and feel free to add this to your slides. Uh, this is when I was uh, reviewing this one, one more time. Uh, so I, I added my own. So if you look at this, uh, this, this graph shows the excess phase as a function of time. First for the ideal clock, let's say, shown in black. And the ideal clock, of course, has a phase that is omega zero t. Remember, you may not be able to observe omega zero t in an ideal clock, which is a square wave, but you can certainly observe it if you have a sinusoid. You can see uh, what, is, what is happening in terms of phase. So if you look at omega zero t, you will see a line, which is the black line. And if you add excess phase to it, which is phi of t, you get then the resulting red curve. The difference between the red curve and the black line essentially is the excess phase in this case. So I'm looking at one particular case where the phase is going to be 2 pi k at the very top. And that 2 pi k, if I look at uh, the red signal, I will see that the corresponding to this, um, that is corresponding to the time tk uh, in red. So omega 0 tk plus phi of tk is equal to 2 pi k. But if I look at the black line, I will see that at omega 0 k t0. And if you manipulate this, you will see that you can bring omega 0 k t to the other side. And you see omega 0 times tk minus k t0 equal minus phi of k t0. And you can recognize the part in the middle essentially is the absolute jitter. So omega 0 times a k is equal to minus phi of k t0. So in other words, now you can see the rest. Uh, phi of k t0 is, is equal to minus omega 0 a k, right? So in other words, if phi of t is excess phase, the sample version of that phi of t becomes phi of k t0, and that is equal to minus omega 0 times a k. So that was my claim initially that jitter essentially is a sampled but scaled version of jitter. <clears throat> um, so or instead of equivalent, I should say that jitter is the sampled but scaled version of um, excess phase. And of course, you can show this in different form, but the form that I like the most is the last line when it says uh, if you take phase, excess phase, and divide it by 2 pi, is the equivalent of getting a k and divided by t0. In other words, if you scale excess phase in terms of 2 pi, showing as a ratio of 2 pi, 
then it will be the same as showing jitter in terms of period, just the same uh, fraction. Now, we just go a little bit more into the math here. So if you have AK, and I'm showing it, this is what I took from the previous slide. AK is equal to minus phi of KT0 divided by omega 0. Obviously, both sides of this represent uh, the discrete time random signal. And then I can find the autocorrelation of these two, and the autocorrelation is shown right underneath. But the missing link here that I've added in red is that if you look at uh, r phi of tau, because remember phi, which is excess phase, is a function of t, right? It's a continuous waveform. And if I look at r phi of t, which is autocorrelation of excess phase, and if I take the Fourier transform of this, I will get s phi of f, which is a power spectral density. Now, if I try to sample this at, at discrete time, I will end up with the second line. And you can see that if I sample my time domain, signal, um, and that is r phi of kt0, then the corresponding spectrum is going to repeat itself and, and shift it in frequency and add up. And that is what you see here. So if I look at s a of f, which is the power spectral density of jitter, I will see that it's essentially the summation of um, power spectral density of excess phase when it's shifted in different multiples of, of the F0 in this case. Um, so in other words, what happens is that uh, the S phi is going to repeat it, be repeated in the frequency domain and add up, add up together. Uh, but when we're defining jitter, because G jitter is a discrete time signal, the power spectral density is defined from minus F0 over 2 to plus F0 over 2. And that is the area that you can see in red. So in other words, these... Um, power spectral densities of um, phi or excess phase, they may have overlap. When you have to take care of that overlap, when you add those, then in the, in the uh, interval of minus F0 over 2 and plus F0 over 2, you will end up getting the power spectral density of the jitter. Um, if there is no overlap, for example, uh, excess phase doesn't contain higher frequencies, it may happen that, in fact, uh, there is no overlap, and if there's no overlap, then it will be simplified as A of F essentially becomes the same power spectral density of the excess phase, but limited, uh, but of course, it's scaled by omega zero squared. Remember, it's omega zero squared, not omega zero, because this is a power spectral density as opposed to signal itself. Okay, so now that we've talked about the uh, concept of um, excess phase and its power spectral density, let's move on now to the phase noise and relationship to jitter. So this is, there's a bit of more math involved here, but I will try to explain this intuitively. It's really not that complicated. I start from a signal, which I call it a clock, as a sinusoid at the very top, V of t, is equal to, uh, let's say, A of t sine of uh, omega zero t plus phi of t, uh, in the uh, first approximation, we're going to assume that A of t is constant. In other words, there's no amplitude modulation. So we go to a fixed A, and then we expand the sinusoids, and the next thing we assume is that assume phi of t is relatively small. And then what you will do is uh, you will see that V of t, which is the clock, essentially is a sinusoid at its pure omega zero value plus this additional noise that, that we have added here. So in other words, what we're showing here is that excess phase in the signal has resulted into equivalently noise in the voltage domain. If you want to find out the characteristic of this uh, signal, we can find the autocorrelation function. And of course, in this case, um, the autocorrelation function that we can just simply find by shifting the signal V of t by tau and then multiply the two and get the expected value, it will end up becoming the, the long expression you see uh, in the fourth line. But this is uh, just to say that this um, autocorrelation turns out to be periodic in terms of t. And when it's periodic in terms of t, it's what is known as cyclostationary. And to find the characteristic, it's typical that for us to find the average of the autocorrelation function in the cyclostationary case. And that is shown as rv of tau bar on the top. And then you take the power spectral density of this, you essentially end up with SV of F, which is the power spectral density of the clock. Except that this power spectral density S is, uh, is two-sided, and we like to make it 
turn it to one-sided, so we multiply by two, and we only look at the positive frequencies. And that is the last line. So this is the takeaway from this slide, that the power spectral density, one-sided power spectral density of your clock, which was supposed to be a sinusoid, is going to give you a delta function at F0 that corresponds to that exact sinusoid, but plus some skirts that we'll see here, and that is S of phi of F minus F0, and that is essentially the power spectral density of the axis phase when it's shifted to F0. So this is shown here on, on this diagram. Um, so we, we see the power spectral density of the sinusoid when it's pure, and that's the delta function as A squared over 2. That's the magnitude of it. But then around it, we have this S phi of F times A squared over 2. Uh, note that, uh, you know, on the top right, I've written the equation from the previous slide, which shows that the power spectral density should be delta function plus a skirt in this case. And this is F minus F0, but in the notation that we decided to use later, and of course is common, is to use F as a deviation from F0 rather than F itself, rather than absolute frequency. So if you change that notation, then essentially what you see is, uh, is what is shown on this figure. What is interesting is that we're looking at power spectral density of the clock itself. We're not looking at the jitter. We're not looking at the power spectral density of jitter. We're looking at the power spectral density in the voltage domain. We have a voltage signal, and we look at this power spectral density using uh, you know, a spectrum analyzer. And what we observe is that magically, the power spectral density of jitter, which is a power the spectral density of a a time function appears in this under the conditions that we discussed. So in other words, S phi of F shows up when we are looking at the spectrum of the clock. What is, what, what is to be noticed here is that that power spectral density of the excess jitter uh, is multiplied by A squared over 2, where A squared over 2 happens to be also the power of the fundamental or the main clock frequency or sinusoid. Uh, the main tone that you have in the signal. So this kind of leaves us to the fact that, okay, if I'm interested in finding the power spectral density of the excess phase or power spectral density of the jitter, all I need to do is to look at power spectral density of the clock itself and then find its skirt and essentially shift it to the left to where zero is, and then essentially I have the power spectral density of the jitter. And that is an important relationship that we will be using uh, later. Now, in this example that I used, I assumed that there was a sinusoid as a clock, but in reality, the clock is not going to be a sinusoid. It's not going to be a pure sinusoid. It's going to be periodic. We can assume it's periodic, but it's, the shape may not be the shape of a sinusoid. It may have harmonics. So what happens in that case? Uh, what, I, what I've tried to mention here is that if you assume that this signal is periodic and has odd symmetry, without really uh, losing any generality here, if you assume it's at odd symmetry and it's periodic, then you can break it down into this Fourier transform. Obviously, that means the clock is not exactly sinusoid, but it's a different shape. And if I break it down into this Fourier series, I will see many components, um, uh, you know, the first harmonic, second harmonic, and so on. And those harmonics are already scaled by a factor of Cn, as shown here. Now. The power spectral density is what is shown on the top, and you can see um, on the top that uh, every time that you have a new harmonic, of course, the amplitude of the new harmonic is different, but the skirt, the skirt is also scaled by n squared. And I want to intuitively explain why this is happening. So the idea is that if you have a signal, a time waveform that is periodic, and you shift it in time by a little bit, that shift in time um, creates different phase, excess phase at different frequencies. So in other words, you have a fixed time, but if you have a, a harmonic that is twice as high frequency as the main harmonic, the, the second harmonic, in other words, will have a period that is half of the period of the original one. Now, if you're introducing the same time deviation to both of these, the timing deviation in the second harmonic looks bigger by a factor of n, by a factor of two. This is shown at the bottom by two curves. So I have the first harmonic shown in red, solid red. The second harmonic is shown in solid black. And what I've done is that I shifted both of them by a fixed amount of time. 
So now they've created this dashed curves. So the dashed fundamental is shown in red. The dashed second harmonic uh, is shown in black. And so what you can see is that the, int the period of the red is T1, which is twice as big as the period of the black, which is T2. But because the, I've added the same offset in time, in one of them it looks twice as big. And so when the excess phase looks twice as big, or in general if it's nth uh, harmonic is n times as big, the power spectral density will be n squared, and hence the factor of n squared in here. Um, so what that means is that, in fact, we could define this, what is now known as phase noise, or L of F, as this is scarce that I defined, the, the power spectral density around the harmonics, divided by the power of the, uh, of the tone. Uh, it could be defined based on the first, or the fundamental frequency, or it could be defined as any harmonics. But if you're defining it based on the harmonics, you have to take care of that n squared factor that should be uh, included here. Um, so now let's, let's see the relationship between phase noise and jitter. Um, if I look at the power spectral density or the phase noise here, L of F, and I would like to find jitter, I'm, I can just use the basic equations that we just went through, knowing that uh, jitter and excess phase have this relationship. Uh, I can find out that the integral of the, of, on, under the um, uh, power spectral density should give me the total RMS or RMS squared of of jitter, and I can just use this uh, in this integral. So, in other words, uh, sigma n squared, uh, sigma a squared in this case, is equal to uh, the integral under the power spectral density from minus f0 over 2 to plus f0 over 2, and if you're using it as a one-sided, there will be a factor of 2, and omega 0 squared is the scaling factor, and so you will end up with a simple equation that says, if you have the phase noise and if you integrate it from let's say some f min uh, to f0 over 2, then you will be able to essentially find the integrated jitter uh, equivalently. Um, one thing that is uh, a bit controversial here is the limits of this integration. And the reason is that if you uh, look at the uh, L of f, you can see as we approach 0, this L of f may in fact go with 1 over f squared or even 1 f to the third uh, towards infinity at very low frequencies. And if you're trying to integrate this from zero, it obviously going to go to infinity. So one question is that what should we decide, what should we put as the integration limits here? And you can see a variety of answers in the literature. Um, but the one that I would like to offer you here is that typically we need to pick an F min. And the F min is usually determined by the observation time. The fact is that if you have a ring oscillator, as I explained earlier, and you let it run for infinity, the jitter, of course, is going to run to infinity. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should not be scared of having, uh, having observed infinity in that case, because this is time that is going to infinity. It's not a voltage that is going to infinity. So the power that we're talking about is a, a fictitious power. It's just the average of, of uh, signal squared. Uh, but the fact is that even in that case, you have certain observation time. You may observe an oscillator uh, for a minute. You may observe it for two minutes before something happens in the system. And so you can therefore limit the, um, the frequency range that is observable within that time period. And that is the fixing the value of f min. The upper level of this is 0.5 f0. And this is because, as I said, um, the jitter, jitter that we're dealing with is a, a random discrete time signal that has uh, the frequency range between minus f0 over 2 and plus f0 over 2. And so we have to uh, take it at that point. Of course, because of aliasing, you may observe a little bit of um, second harmonic or others that are kind of mixed a little bit and come down to this frequency range, but those are typically negligible, and what you will get is relatively accurate results. Uh, in reality, there's another part, and that is this jitter that we observe is going to go through some sort of filtering. So you have jitter that is going to your system, but the system has its own transfer function, and that transfer function is going to influence jitter. The example I'm showing here is that the uh, jitter, for example, L of F, the phase noise, has a, a 1 over F squared at low frequency. But if you um, feed this to a system that is high pass filtered, it's going to attenuate the low frequency content of this signal. And as a result, you will get the uh, power spectral density in red. And in this case, there's no ambiguity 
to go all the way to zero. We can, in fact, find, integrate this from zero to F zero over two without any, any error. Okay, so um, I mentioned that uh, I have about an hour and a half and I realized that I'm moving a bit slow, so I'm going to um, speed up a little bit. But this is okay because now we're going through examples. So um, this is the, uh, a flat phase noise profile. So imagine that you have a phase noise uh, which is flat. You have a harmonic and you have a flat response. That flat response is shown as L0 here, and essentially I'm using the equation that I showed you before in order to find uh, the RMS of jitter. In this numerical example, I'm using F0 being one gigahertz. This is the clock frequency. L0 being 100 dBc per hertz. That is how it's often expressed as dB with respect to the carrier per hertz. And in this case, it's 10 to the minus 13. If you put these numbers into that equation, you will get uh, jitter, absolute jitter, which is 1.5, sorry, 1.6 picosecond. That's RMS of jitter. So that has to be compared against one nanosecond. One nanosecond is the interval or unit interval or period, and you're observing 1.6 picosecond, so which is 1.6% um, um, of the clock period. If you look at one of our F squared jitter profile, this was the, from free running uh, ring oscillator, you can again integrate this from F min to F max and you will have the equation in the notes. Uh, but then again, if you limit this and put it in FLL, uh, sorry, in a PLL, then you find out that the F3 dB um, is going to uh, cause this jitter uh, to be constant below F3 dB uh, and then is going to go down with one over F squared afterwards. And so that will impact uh, the jitter and they will reduce the jitter RMS. Just to show you that these simple numerical examples are quite good and, and handy, uh, you, we looked at the paper from um, ISSCC 2014 and many of these papers that you can see that they actually show you the phase noise. And so if you look at the phase noise that is shown as a plot that they've measured and you just extract these simple parameters from them, for example, F3 dB and L0, and then you will uh, calculate uh, RMS of jitter using this technique or look at the paper when they actually go ahead and measure it. You see that these results are quite similar. In fact, in the bottom case when the F3dB is 4 megahertz and L0 was minus 104 dBc per hertz, you see that this simple calculation equation that, that I've given you will give you 697 femtosecond, but if you use the measurement results, the report results is 680 femtosecond. So they're very close to each other, and this is a very useful um, tool. Other thing that you want to do is that if you want to do simulations with jitter, uh, this, this comes in really handy. So you, you want to go ahead and design a system. You have a MATLAB, you have a simulating model, and you would like to see the effect of a particular jitter. So in this case, you need to uh, generate jitter. You want to generate a jitter with a certain profile. So how do you do this? And the answer is very simple. In fact, you could use, I'm showing you here some code from MATLAB, but of course you can use any of these free, freely available software like Julian these days that is very popular with students uh, to generate this. So just going to go quickly through this. So we're trying to now generate um, 1 million samples for a one uh, gigahertz clock with flat phase noise of minus 110 dBc per hertz. So this is our first example. We just want to use, we want to create jitter samples of jitter, in this case, one million samples, that if you look at them, uh, they will be for a one gigahertz clock, will have a flat phase noise of 100, minus 110 dB C per hertz. And you can just kind of go through the lines here, but I'm not going to go through other examples as, as much. So we have set the frequency to 1 E9. We have set L0 to 110. We chose a number of points to be 1 million, and then we have uh, created sigma, which is corresponding to this. So let me let me just tell you that if you're going to use flat, what the trick here is this, you need to create uh, independent samples from a Gaussian distribution. So if you have a Gaussian distribution, you just create independent samples. And if they're independent, they're going to give you a flat frequency response. So you create the value of sigma based on the equation that we've given you on the previous page, and then you go and find the ideal timing. Ideal timing, of course, is just fixed intervals that you add, and that creates a vector. And then you create jitter, and the jitter is essentially the sigma that you found, and then multiply this by a Gaussian jitter for that number of points, and then you add the two together. So you have the timing corresponding to 
uh, a clock that now has a jitter profile that is flat in that range. Uh, you could go ahead and try to do this for uh, um, jitter samples for a high pass, low pass, or band pass for profile. But again, the trick is that first generate your flat frequency response. Once you create a flat, then what you do in this case, um, uh, you can uh, apply, for example, a Butterworth filter or any other filter that you have available, and then you can shape it the way you like it. So we'll start from flat and then shape it. Here's another example when we're going to do one over F squared uh, jitter. And again, this is very useful for uh, modeling and for simulations. You want to have create that one over F squared that was coming from ring oscillators, for example. How do you create uh, that jitter data that gives you that property? And in this case, we start from flat again, and then we integrate. As you know, when we integrated a flat frequency response, we're going to get one over F, but in power spectral density, that will translate to one over F squared. So again, uh, these um, um, codes are all available for, uh, for download from the website that I've mentioned here. Now, the last part of uh, this talk is about jitter measurement and intentional jitter. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to be the topic that will be discussed a little bit more in depth uh, by Nicola. So I'm not going to dwell uh, too much on this, but not to worry, this is going to be covered um, a little bit later. So let me just go through the few slides that I have. So the first thing is that we want to measure absolute jitter. We talked a little bit about the, all the definitions and the concepts, but when it comes to reality, we need to measure it. We want to measure this. And this is example that we had is that we had a, a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter, of course, adds its own jitter to the data. By the time the data arrives at the receiver, you need to now clock it. That clock has its own jitter. So we are, this is the meeting point of two jittery source. One is the data jitter, data that's coming from transmitter that is that is collected jitter over the, over the time, and the other one is the received or recovered clock. So how could we distinguish the jitter between the two? If you just feed them into a, a D flop flop or a sampler, you're going to observe relative jitter. And I've shown this here symbolically that if you have a phase detector at the, at the beginning of the CDR, that phase detector essentially is looking at the relative jitter. Relative jitter is what is being measured, but we like to measure absolute jitter. So you have one observation point that is giving you the absolute, that gives you the relative jitter, the difference between the two, but we're interested in the two variables that are um, showing here. So how could we find or measure absolute jitter in this case? And we don't have access to an ideal clock, by the way. I mean, that would be one way. If you have ideal clock and just measure it directly. So what we do in this case is that we uh, add an additional clock, an auxiliary um, signal that we, we have here. So it, it, this diagram shows that if you have, for example, jitter psi A, psi B, we add just psi C, and we're adding additional phase detector. And by uh, finding the cross correlation between those, those three, we can actually find the exact um, um, the exact estimate of the absolute jitter for the two cases. Again, uh, this is uh, discussed in detail in JSSC 2015, so you, you can look at this. And of course, this was implemented uh, in silicon for a 10 uh, uh, gigabit per second system, and as you can see, you have two uh, RX lanes, and then we added a, an additional PD in the middle, and we have this on-chip digital uh, circuit that is going to um, explore what it, or find the value of the absolute jitter. Um, the measurement is also shown here. Um, on the left, you will see that if you have 100 megahertz sinusoidal jitter applied and we want to estimate this jitter, we have this on-chip jitter measurement that the way I explained it to you. And of course, we have access to an 80 giga samples per second real oscilloscope. And we kind of measure that if you insert jitter and then we measure it once using the oscilloscope, once using this um, on-chip technique, uh, how close they are. And you can see that they're relatively close, but the error in this case is less than 580 femtosecond. If you look at the case on the right, this says that I, I run out of time. Um, the measured jitter on the, the case on the right is shown that, in fact, the error is less than 100 picosecond. Um, we talked about jitter. We kind of said so many um, negative things about jitter. Jitter is not good. We need to get rid of it. It's going to affect performance. But the fact is that there are cases where jitter is actually good, and we can utilize jitter. Uh, one example of this I've taken from a JSC paper in 2003, 
when the authors are adding intentional data jitter and intentional edge jitter in order to linearize the system. So jitter in time domain is equivalent to dither in the voltage domain. If you're familiar with dithering, this is the same concept, but in the um, time domain. And it does help with the linearity of the system. Uh, another example is the example that, I, that we use in my own group with uh, my graduate student, Joshua Liang, and it was published in CICC 2017. And, and this was the case of adding jitter in order to create more observability for our, ourselves. Again, this is a topic that uh, Nicola Dadals will talk about a little bit uh, about this, but the fact is that when we have a bank-bank phase detector, the bank-bank phase detector is nonlinear by nature. And so essentially it's trying to uh, take the jitter information that they have and, and do a nonlinear operation on it. And as soon as you do nonlinear operation, you're going to lose some information. It turns out that this way that we model the phase detector through a, a KPD, which is a linearized version um, or linear, linearized model of the um, phase detector, is going to uh, be a function of jitter itself. So in other words, if you have more jitter in the system, you're going to have less KPD. If you have less jitter, you have a larger KPD. And the fact that it has become chicken and egg problem because we have two unknowns and we're trying to find them uh, using the same observation points. And the way we resolve this is by adding or injecting a square wave jitter. This is known jitter. We only add it to as, um, as much as one LSP of the phase interpolator that we had. And we inserted this only for the, uh, uh, for the zero crossings or for the edge, not for the center data. And by doing this, uh, we managed to um, add, an, again, an, another observation and then decipher, solve the equations to find out how much jitter we have. So this uh, figure shows that if you have white um, random jitter shown in red on top, then the um, autocorrelation function will essentially have one dot at zero. If you have this injected square wave, you will have a rectangle, uh, you will have a triangular waveform. But if you mix the two, then you have enough information uh, to decipher KPD as well as the, um, the um, uh, relative jitter in this case. So here's a summary. So what we we went through the uh, all the fundamental concepts of jitter and phase noise. We talked about jitter definition. We defined absolute jitter, relative jitter, and period jitter. And we mentioned that these will find their applications um, in different systems, such as wireline data converters and, and wireless. We talked about jitter histogram, PDF, and PSD. We said that the statistics can collect some information about jitter, but not about the timing behavior. And for this, we had to resort to autocorrelation function and power spectral density. We defined excess phase as a continuous random signal. And we said that jitter is a sample version of this excess phase, of course, uh, by some weighting. Um, phase noise LFF measured in dBc per hertz and is defined as the PSD of the clock divided by the carrier power at the frequency offset F from the carrier. And finally, we said we can use jitter to our advantage, and we showed the two examples when jitter can be used to linearize the system and where jitter can be injected intentionally uh, to improve observability. Here's a list of references. I would like to acknowledge the fact that most of the material in this uh, uh, tutorial was taken from a, a book that is written by Nicola Dadalta and myself. And, uh, and of course, uh, through some of the work that my graduate students have done um, over the years. So I would like to, in fact, acknowledge uh, the book. I acknowledge Nicola Dadal for his contributions, and also all my past graduate students who are working on this topic that are listed here. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Tom Rosson from Fujitsu Labs, for which we collaborated over many years on the area of wireline. Thank you very much.